So thanks, Yukie, for the very nice introduction. And also, Yohan and Yukie, thanks for the invitation today. So I'm Sugiyama. So today, my talk is about quite fundamental machine learning, but hope that we can have nice communication and discussion at the end of the talk. And uh, as I introduced, so I'm from Riken and the University of Tokyo. So University of Tokyo is a university, so we don't have to really explain, but Riken is a national research center in Japan. So let me spend a few minutes to, to introduce Riken in the beginning. So what is Riken? So it's a national research institute in Japan and in Japanese, so Riken is written in this way, six, six characters. So this is pronounced as Rikagaku Kenkyu Sho. And literally, this means Physics and Chemistry Research Institute. But six letters are actually too long for Japanese to, to use. So we prefer to shorten it. And we take this character and this character. So this is pronounced as Riken. And Riken previously called Research Institute for Physics and Chemistry or something like that. But now this Japanese acronym, Riken, is the official name. So Riken is not an acronym anymore, but this is the official name of our center. So then what is Riken AIP? So this is, I am belonging. So Riken founded Center for Advanced Intelligence Project. It's called AIP in 2016 under the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology in Japan. So it's a national project center. So in this center, we have about 130 employed researchers and about 40% are international researchers and more than about one quarter are female researchers. So our center is actually quite diverse. And we have about 250 visiting researchers from universities and industries, and also 130 domestic students. And in addition, so we, we invited actually many international interns before the COVID days. So in total, we accepted 140 students. And we stopped the internship program for the last couple of years. But this year, we resumed the program and we started to invite new interns. Hope that we can have more interns in the near future. Then also, we are quite active in collaborating with international you know, partners and also industry. And our center is located really in the center of Tokyo. So it's like a walking distance from the central Tokyo station. So we are located on this building, 15th floor. So it's somewhere here. And inside this building, we have a big you know, open discussion room like this. And in addition, so we have many teams and they are distributed across the entire Japan from Sendai to like Kyoto and Fukuoka. So if you have a chance to come to Japan, please visit our center. And here is a, some, some snapshot of our research at Weekend AIP. So we have one group working on fundamental machine learning and I'm, I also belong to this, this group. And in this group, we are studying the theory of deep learning. So we try to you know, mathematically understand why deep learning works quite well. And already some you know, mysterious facts are revealed through some theoretical analysis. And also we are developing new machine learning technologies. And this is the part of my talk today. So weekly supervised learning, noise robust learning. And also nowadays, some teams are working on causal inference. So this is also a quite, quite important topic nowadays. Then also we are doing a lot of applied research and one pillar is, is accelerating scientific research by AI. And our particular focus is medical science. Like some, some teams are working on prostate cancer detection or pancreatic cancer detection or ALS diagnosis, fetal heart screening and colonoscopy. And also material science is an important challenge. I, I think many groups of AI are working on like, like optimizing the combination of the atoms and, and some material based on Bayesian optimization and some other techniques. But we are actually using natural language processing techniques to automatically scan you know, material science papers and create database. And also we are working on data-driven science in general, in particular hypothesis testing. So people often use t-test or some standard statistical test to, to see whether the obtained results are you know, statistically significant, significant or not. But this is actually not really correct if hypotheses are derived based on machine learning algorithms. So in that scenario, actually we need 
uh, another technique called select beam friends. This is a relatively new topic, but this is actually quite important in data-driven science. Some teams are working on this topic. The more applied research are uh, like solving socially critical problems, like, like we are working on natural disasters. So Riken has another center working on supercomputer, and they have one of the world fastest supercomputer called Fugaku. It, it will be a huge supercomputer. And we are allowed to use that one to do some earthquake simulation. And also elderly healthcare is an important and urgent challenge in Japan and education too. Then finally, we also have like non-scientific topics. Like we have even social you know, researchers. Like we are working on uh, discussing AI ethical guidelines or personal data management and also AI security and reliability. So these are nowadays becoming more and more important. Okay, that was ab about the introduction of Wiccan AIP. And let's come to the main part of my talk. So it's about reliable machine learning. So the goal of this, this line of research is to develop novel machine learning theories and algorithms that enable reliable learning from limited information. So this limited information is actually a key word for, for our team. And more spe specifically, we are working on these four topics these days. The first one is to learn from insufficient information. This is something we call weekly supervised learning, and I will cover you know, this, this topic today. Then the second challenge is to learn from biased data. So because of some changing environments, or maybe because of some privacy concerns, we are not allowed to collect data as we wish. Then data is essentially biased and we need to somehow debias the data or we need to train a classifier or a predictor in an unbiased way. So this is a big challenge. And this is essentially the same as transfer learning or domain adaptation type of research. Then the third one is to learn from noisy labels. So nowadays data is collected by, you know, in, in, so in a large scale way. So then, we have a lot of human error in the data, but well, sometimes even labels are collected by sensors. Then sensor naturally has errors. We need to copy them. Then finally, more, more seriously, so attacks are actually quite, quite critical. So it, it is known that deep learning systems can be easily attacked by slightly changing the input pattern. So this is often called adversarial noise or adversarial distribution shift. So coping with these adversarial attacks is actually like nowadays an urgent challenge for, for machine learning researchers. So we are interested in these topics. And today I try to briefly cover the first three topics. Then let me start from the first topic. So weekly supervised learning. So machine learning from big label data is successful in many applications, like in speech recognition, image understanding, language translation, or advertisement. So in the simplest way, so it's a classification problem. Let's say binary classification problem. So we are given positive data and negative data, and we want to find a boundary between two classes. And already we know that estimation error of this boundary decreases in the order of one over square root of n, where n is the number of label samples. So the, the graph is something like this. So this means if we have four times more data, then our error can be, estimation error can be halved. So that, that's why we need big data. But in reality, there are various applications where big label data is not really available, or it is not possible to collect big data like in the case of medical research or natural disasters, maybe robot control and brain signal analysis. So it's quite difficult to collect big data. So that's the challenge here. Then, so one of the simplest solution would be to give up supervised classification and resort to unsupervised classification. In this unsupervised classification scenario, we don't use any labels. So we are just given unlabeled data, black points like this. But still, we want to classify these black points into blue and red, positives and negatives. So clearly, this is impossible. So usually, we end up in just using clustering to separate unlabeled data into you know, just disjoint clusters. And 
hope that one cluster corresponds to one class or something like that. But clearly, so there's no guarantee that this works well as a supervised classification method. Then one good compromise is semi-supervised classification. So in addition to a large number of unlabeled data, we use a small amount of labeled data. Like in the simplest case, maybe we have one positive point here and one negative point here. Then in the classical semi-supervised classification, so these labeled points are propagated along clusters, like in this way. Then in the end, so this cluster is basically colored in blue and this cluster is colored in red and something like that. But again, so essentially this is also based on clustering. So there's no guarantee for prediction. So unless one cluster completely corresponds to one class, but this doesn't happen in practice. So to cope, cope with labeling cost, so there are several different approaches. Like we may directly improve the data collection process itself. Like for example, if, if we use crowdsourcing, we can you know, ask a large number of you know, web users to label data. This could be one of the cheapest way to collect a large number of labels. So this is quite useful in many simple tasks like image classification. But if data is quite private, so there's no way that you know, we are not allowed to put it on the web. So then we cannot use crowdsourcing. Or we may use a simulator to generate pseudo data. So this is possible in some physics experiments or chemistry process or robot control. But so for other type of data, maybe we don't really have simulator and we can't really generate pseudo data. Then, so it is always true that we should use our domain knowledge. So this is always done in many companies and many research labs. We do a lot of engineering to just improve the performance. Then our approach try to use cheap but weak data. So this is a slightly different approaches from the first three. So one of the typical examples is unlabeled data, but we can naturally extend this scenario to more interesting weekly supervised learning scenarios. The summary so far is something like this. So I took the classification accuracy on the horizontal axis, so low and high, then the labeling cost on the vertical axis, low and high. Then supervised classification is located somewhere here. So it can achieve the highest classification accuracy, but its labeling cost is also highest. Then unsupervised classification, so there's no labels. So labeling cost is the lowest, but the classification accuracy is not really guaranteed. So it is located on the bottom left corner. Then the semi-supervised classification. So this was expected to work better than unsupervised classification. But it's not always true. So this is still located on the left-hand side of the figure. So then this bottom right corner, so this area, so high classification accuracy and low labeling cost. So this is the target of weekly supervised learning. And already we found several useful examples of weekly supervised learning scenarios. And I would like to introduce those scenarios in the next few slides. Okay, the first typical example is called positive unlabeled classification. So in this scenario, we are only given positive data and unlabeled data. So like this, so we are given blue positive points here and unlabeled points, black ones. And, and this is a binary classification problem. So unlabeled data is basically a mixture of positives and negatives, but we don't know which one is positive or which one is negative. So they are just black. So given positive data and unlabeled data, we still want to train a classifier that separates positives and negatives. So negatives are actually located here, hidden. So we want to have a boundary like this, only from blue and black points. So this uh, problem, so we call it PU classification, is actually quite, quite conceivable in many applications. For example, typical example is advertisement click prediction in internet companies. If an, if an advertisement is clicked by a user, then we can expect that that user likes that advertisement. So it is a positive sample. But what happens if the advertisement is not clicked by that user? We may naively think, so 
because it was not clicked, so it is a negative sample. But this is not always true, because maybe user disliked that advertisement. That's why he or she didn't click it. Or maybe user likes that ad advertisement, but he or she doesn't have time to click it. Or maybe he or she clicked another advertisement. So this basically means an unclicked advertisement is still unlabeled. It can be either positive or negative. So in this scenario, we can naturally collect only positive data and unlabeled data, but still we want to classify positives and negatives. So this is the PU classification problem. And we had a nice solution for this problem. And I have one technical slide here, and let me briefly go through this. So as a setting, we are given independent positive points and independent un unlabeled points. So two sets of samples. Then as usual, we define a loss function that measures the discrepancy between the label and classifier output. And this point-wise loss is expected over the entire training distribution. This is a classification risk that we want to minimize. And this classification risk can be decomposed into the positive part and negative part naively. And in the standard supervised learning case, we have both positive data and negative data. Then, so these two terms can be naively approximated by sample averages. But now it's a PU classification problem. So we, we have a positive data, so we can estimate this term easily. But this second term is actually the problem because we don't have negative data. So how to handle this second term is the technical challenge here. So by, by the way, we have pi and one minus pi here. And pi is the, the class prior, so it's p of y equals plus one. So in, in principle, we need to estimate pi also from data, pu data. And already there's a series of papers working on estimating pi from pu data. And Today, to make the story simple, I just assume pi is known. But in practice, we estimate pi also from data. So then so let's come back to the second term. So this is the expectation of uh, negative samples. So we cannot directly approximate this term, but there's a simple trick. So we know that unlabeled data density, px, is the mixture of positive data density and negative data density and the mix, mixing proportions are pi and one, one, one minus pi. Then, so this part can be just replaced with px minus pi p of x given y equals plus one. So this term is basically expanded in this way. So this is a completely equivalent expression. But now this expectation is only over unlabeled data that can be estimated from these samples. Then this term is the expectation over positive samples. And this can also be estimated from these positive samples. Then finally, we can naively obtain an unbiased risk estimator like this. So these are this, this can be computed from these given samples. And we just prepare any model like neural network or kernel model and just minimize this empirical risk. Then so we can obtain a solution. And theoretically, we can prove that so the, the empirical risk minimizer actually achieves the optimal convergence rate. So it, it, this solution converts to the true optimal solution with the order of one over square root of NP plus one over square root of NU. So NP and NU are number of samples here. And this is known to be the theoretical optimal. So we cannot improve this one anymore. So this means, so this is an extremely simple method, but so this method is already theoretically optimal. And this was a PU classification problem, and we had some following up work here. But this scenario can be extended to many different scenarios in the same way. Like in PU case, we assume that we have both positive and unlabeled data. But often, unlabeled data is not available, but only positive data is available. Like if we care, like, like some purchase prediction in some companies, then th that company is not allowed to access the database of other companies. So in that case, they cannot even access unlabeled data, but only positive data. But if you only have a set of positive data points, this is just a one class classification and essentially unsupervised classification. We cannot really solve the problem. But once positive samples are equi equipped with confidence, 
Like it's like the class posterior probability. Like this point is 70% positive, but this point is 20% positive or something like that. Then we can actually train the classifier in, in, a, in a nice way, in an optimal way. And this unlabeled, unlabeled scenario is even more challenging. So now we have no labels at all, but we are given two unlabeled data sets. So the situation is something like this. So there are two hospitals and we can collect medical images from two hospitals, but none of the images are labeled like cancer or non-cancer, but they are all, all unlabeled. But if we can assume that, so we know the proportion of cancer patients, like in one hospital, we have 60% cancer patient and 40% non-cancer patient. But in another hospital, we have only 20% cancers and 80% non-cancer, something like that. Then only from proportions of positives or cancers, we can actually train the classifier and obtain the decision boundary in an optimal way. Essentially the same rate as supervised learning. So this is a bit special case, but it's actually a surprising result because we don't have any single labels, but still we can perform supervised classification. Then a special case of this UU classification is called similar dissimilar classification. So in some delicate classification problem, like, like if we want to ask, so is your income more than like $100,000 per year or something like that? Then, so I, I want to collect labels, yes or no, but nobody wants to answer that kind of personal question. But instead I can ask, so is your answer same as this person or is your answer different from that person or something like that? Then we have data pairs. So two points are in the same class, but we don't know whether they are positives or negatives. Well, these two points belong to different classes, but we don't know which one is positive and which one is negative. So these are like similarity or dissimilarity information. And we can also show that this is actually a special case of this UU classification. And we can show that the classification problem can be solved only from similar dissimilar data pairs. And essentially all problems can be solved in the same way. And all are like loss correction based and statistically consistent. So this order is achieved. And this is a quite general framework. So any loss function, any classifier, and any optimizers can be used here. So these are binary classification problems, but we can also consider multi-class classification problems because labeling patterns in multi-class problems is even more painful. Like in image classification problems, we may have like 1,000 classes. Then choosing the right you know, class is actually extremely time-consuming and painful. So to overcome this problem, so we consider several multi-class weak labels. The first one is called complementary labels. A usual label specifies a class that a pattern belongs to, like this point belongs to class one, or this point belongs to class three, or this image contains dog, or this image contains airplane, or something like that. But complementary label is its like complementary you know, counterpart. So it, it specifies a class that a pattern does not belong to. Like this sample does not belong to class two, or this sample does not belong to class one, or this image does not contain dog or something like that. So such a not label is actually much easier to obtain than standard labels. But we can show that only from complementarily labeled you know, data, we can still train the classifier in the optimal way. And the slight extension is called partial labels. So partial label is a vague label. It specifies a subset of classes that contain the correct one. Like this sample belongs to class one or two, or this image contains dog or cat or something like that, so, or a label. So this is much easier to obtain. But again, we can train the classifier only from these partial, partial labels. Then finally, single class confidence. So, so uh, let's say in the three class problem, we can collect data only from class one. But if these class one samples are equipped with full confidence, like class one with 60%, class two with 30%, and class three with 10% or something like that, then we can train a multi-class classifier only from class one samples, single class confidence. So again, so these all problems can be solved in, in, the, same, in the same way systematically, and we can achieve the, the optimal convergence rate in the same way. 
So all together, so we try to explore this bottom right corner of, of the you know, figure here. So high classification accuracy. So high accuracy basically means one over square root of n convergence. So this is the theoretical optimal. And low labeling cost. So cost, labeling cost should be lower than supervised line. And hopefully close to unsupervised. And we have many different variations of the problem, but all problems can be solved essentially in the same framework. So that means we can basically combine all pieces of information, like positive, negative, unlabeled, similar, dissimilar, positive confidence, negative confidence, similar confidence, or dissimilar confidence. So these can be all together used in the same framework. So last year, we actually wrote a book on this topic and it was just published last year. So if you have some interest in this kind of research, it would be great if you take a look at this book and give us some feedback. Okay, that was the, the first part of weekly supervised learning. It was actually the longest part. And the second two are a bit shorter. The second topic is about transfer learning. So learning from bias data. So let, let's consider the situation where training data and test data have different distributions. Maybe such, such different distributions can happen due to changing the environment, maybe over time, or because of some sampling, some sample selection bias due to privacy reasons. And transfer learning is aimed at training a test domain predictor using training data coming from different domains. And this is not really a new topic. And even I organized a workshop more than 15 years ago at, at NIPS. And after that, we had a edited volume from, from this workshop. And nowadays, actually, this book becomes quite popular because transfer learning is becoming a, a new, new boom again in the last couple of years. So then the basics of th this transfer learning approach is, is importance-weighted training. So to simplify the story, let's consider the situation called covariate shift. So in this scenario, only input distributions change, like P of X changes, but P of Y given X, so output given input distribution, this does not change. Like situation is like, like this. We have a target function. This is a regulation problem. We have a target function. And so input points, training input points are somewhere from the left-hand side. So we have blue training points like this. But test points are coming from the right-hand side because P of X is different. So then these black crosses are test points. So given blue points, we want to predict black crosses. So this is a kind of extrapolation problem and extremely challenging. And naively, if we use like these squares, for example, then we just fit blue points you know, quite nicely like this. So this, this perfectly fits the blue points, but this is not useful for estimating the black crosses. So this is the, the problem of covariate shift. So ordinary training is not statistically consistent. So in this scenario, actually we prefer to use so-called importance weighted training. So before the loss function, we multiply it with the importance. So this is the ratio of P test and P train. Then surprisingly, so only trained from blue points, we obtain this kind of green line. So it, it can predict black crosses quite well. And theoretically, we can show that this importance weighted training is consistent. But the problem is, so this importance is unknown. So we need to also estimate it from data. So that was the main target of the result. And the classical approaches are okay, two step. In the first step, the importance weight is estimated. So we actually explored several different importance weighting, the importance estimation techniques, and we actually published that book many years ago. Then one of the typical formulation is called D squares importance fitting. So we just directly fit our importance model to the true importance. And this can be actually computed from, from, from data. Then we obtain W hat. So it's an estimate of the importance weight. Oh, then, oh sorry, this, is, this should be W hat. So then, so we have importance, estimated importance weight here and just perform you know, importance weighted training and obtain the solution. So this was the classical approach we proposed 10 years ago. But the problem is, so in the first step, so we are estimating the importance weight, 
but we don't really take into account the second step when we perform the first step. Then the small error occurred in the first step can be magnified in the second step. So in the end, the performance of the final solution can be quite bad. So we want to somehow avoid this problem by integrating these two steps. So this is this is a challenge for, for many years. And recently, we had some nice solutions. The first solution is called joint weight predictor optimization. So in this scenario, so we have labeled training data and unlabeled test data. So this is like a semi-supervised learning or, unsu uh, or unsupervised domain adaptation. Then to solve this problem, we actually first derived an upper bound of the true risk function. So it's written by J here. And interestingly, our J has two terms. And this first term corresponds to the first step of the previous classical approach. And the second term corresponds to the second step of the classical approach. And we minimize this upper bound with respect to both importance weight and, and the class area, predictor F. So then, so this shows that in the classical approach, so we actually minimize the upper bound in two steps. So first, first term is minimized first, then this is fixed and second term is fixed. So clearly this is support now. So now we can minimize this upper bound simultaneously, both with, with respect to W and F. And then we can show that this actually has a nice convergence guarantee like this. So our final solution is theoretically guaranteed in this way. So this is one, one nice solution. Then another solution is called dynamic importance weighting. And this is actually quite general method and we can consider general distribution change, like P of X, Y. So joint distribution changes in an arbitrary way. So this is the most challenging scenario. But we assume that we have a large number of label training data uh, as usual. And also we require a small number of label test data. So this is so-called supervised domain adaptation. So we need some labels also from test domain. But once we have a small number of test samples, then so we perform like mini batch training of neural network. And we select some small mini batch from these two sets. So these are written here. Then for these mini batch data points, we estimate the importance weight. So in, in this way, this is called kernel mean matching. So left-hand side, it is an importance weighted training loss. And right-hand side, it's uh, just an average test loss. And so W should be estimated in, in a way that these two should be approximately equal. And this can be efficiently achieved by the method called kernel mean matching. So this is an extremely simple method, but it, it's actually highly powerful. No assumption is needed. We can essentially apply this method to any changing distribution. So then this is a summary of the, the transfer learning part. So simultaneously performing importance estimation and predictor training is shown to be promising. But what happened, what should we do if training and test distribution look very different? It looks like there's no way to transfer knowledge from training to testing. But if data generation mechanism is shared, it is possible to transfer. So this was called mechanism transfer, and we had some method previously. And also our current challenge is to, to cope with continuous distribution shift. So in the previous work, we only considered training distribution and one test distribution, and we just uh, adapt our predictor from training to testing. But in the real world scenario, maybe the test distribution is also changing over time. So we have test one, test two, test three, you know, until some future. So we want to somehow you know, follow the changing distribution. So this is our current challenge. And we had the first work in, in the last new reaps, and we are also publishing the, the second work now. So hope that we can continue this kind of research and try to have a more general uh, distribution shift adaptation techniques. So the noise robust part, so let's briefly go through this part in five minutes or so. So let's consider standard supervised learning problem. So clean labels like this. Then, so we just perform you know, machine learning in a standard way and it works well. But in reality, we often have noisy labels like this, maybe due to human error. Then we can actually show that Training error minimization, standard training, 
is no longer consistent. So this means that even if we have infinitely many data points, noisy data points, our solution is not optimal yet. So we need an explicit mechanism to, to modify the predictor for, from noisy labels. So then, so let's skip this part. Then our, our approach is based on so-called noise transition correction. So in this scenario, we consider so-called the noise transition matrix T. So this is a three by three matrix in the three class case. And one zero zero means label one is always label one and label two and three does not happen, do not happen. Then point one, point eight, point one. So this means label, uh, class two is 80% correct, but it becomes class one or class three with 10%. Well, point five, point five zero. So this is actually the worst scenario. Class three label is never correct. And it always becomes class one or class two with 50%. So basically this represents, this matrix T represents the clean to noise flipping probability. Then there's a nice theory here proposed by Patrini et al. So T is essentially like a noise process. Then T inverse is basically a denoising process. So they actually propose a loss correction method to eliminate noise by applying T inverse to the loss function. Well, T is a noise process. So if T is applied to a learned classifier, then so classifier somehow adjusted to, to noisy data. So these two approaches are actually statistically consistent. So this means that once we have T, then we can train the classifier in, in a valid way. But the problem is that T is unknown, and we want to estimate T only from noisy data. But it turned out this is really a challenging problem, but we had some series of work. And finally, so we could have a very general method that can estimate T under weaker condition. So now this problem is almost solved. But in reality, so the problems are even more challenging. Because in the previous slide, so noise was basically independent of samples instances. So this means that noise appears everywhere in a uniform way like this. But in reality, noise appears near the boundary, maybe more frequently, because these points are much difficult to classify. In this scenario, so it's called instant dependent noise. So the noise transition matrix is now a function of x. So this is an extremely challenging problem, and maybe there's no way to really solve it in, in a theoretically justified way. So, so far we focused on some heuristics and had several methods, but maybe this method can be further improved and this is still an ongoing research topic. Okay, then, so let's, let me summarize my, my talk. So today's focus was so reliable machine learning and most of the methods were basically so considering reliability for expectable situations. So this means that we explicitly model the corruption process and corrected the solution based on this, this model. But often, you know, modeling the noisy process, corruption process is quite difficult and we have often modeling error. So how to handle the modeling error is an important topic nowadays. Then another completely different direction would be to consider reliability for unexpected situations. Like we don't know what happens in the future. So then, so one way is to consider the worst case scenario. So mathematically it's called minimax optimization. So we consider worst case scenario. So error is maximized under some distribution shift or whatever. But still we want to minimize the error. So this is possible to solve in, in some situations. So it, it, it gives a so-called minimax solution. But unfortunately, such a minimax solution is often quite conservative. Like in, in the worst, in, 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 for, for example, if you consider a robot control problem, and then the minimax solution is often not, not to move the robot at all. Because once the robot moves slightly, then there is a risk of you know, corrupting the robot. Then so it, it's actually better not to move it. But clearly, such a conservative solution is useless at all. So how to make it less conservative is an important challenge here. Then another possibility is to include human support in, in machine learning process. So it is often called the classification with rejection. 
like in medical diagnosis, for example, if the you know diagnosis by AI system is quite ambiguous, then maybe we could ask the medical doctor to manually classify the, the, that image. So in that way, we can ask human expert to, to classify difficult samples. So in, in the medical example, maybe this is possible, but suppose in the autonomous driving car, so because human drivers are not driving a car anymore, it is not possible to you know, ask human support in, in such real-time applications. So this is still a training scenario, how to cope with the real-time scenarios in you know, human support, in human-included classification scenarios. So in practice, I expect that exploring somewhere in between these two scenarios is practically more useful. Like we have some, some knowledge, partial knowledge of the corruption process, but not perfectly. But still, we want to utilize such partial knowledge to improve the performance and obtain a better, like less conservative solution than, than the minimax scenario. So then this is the final scenario. So <laughs> final slide. And I don't really have a strong message here, but my background is like computer science and machine learning. Then we are basically interested in more like a computational intelligence. And that the talk today was mostly on improving the prediction accuracy. So like targeting regression problem and classification problem. I mean, this is one aspect of computational intelligence, but nowadays other aspects are more interesting and maybe useful, like generation, data generation process, learning the generation process is quite useful, like GAN, or stable diffusion, or chat GPT. So these are like generative AIs and they are extremely you know, hot and useful in many applications nowadays. Or intervention is another important challenge. If prediction is basically done based on correlation of, of input and output, but correlation is different from causality. So changing, you know, if you want to change the you know, prediction, then analyzing the intervention is quite important. So this is a topic of causal inference or reinforcement learning is also part of them because we you know, do, do something in one step, then this is influenced to the next step. So it's a kind of intervention. Then simulation is also another important you know, direction. So like, like in multi-agent systems or digital twins, so we can do a lot of simulation to, to you know, predict the future. And combining machine learning and simulation is nowadays also a big topic in like natural disaster analysis or some physics system analysis. So these are computational side, but today I, I think audiences are even more diverse and embodiment would be quite, I, I think, bigger framework. And this is completely beyond my scope, but so I, I'm just working on computers. But we have robots and we have humans. So like human computer, human computer interaction is of course quite important. And human aug augmentation, maybe this is a combination of human and robot. This is also quite important. And also robotics itself is important. And maybe neuroscience people are studying human itself. So they have a lot of diverse topics, but hope that like these you know, three topics are merged together and we can really have the kind of next generation AI systems. Okay, thank you very much. This is the end of the, the talk.